artillery, one of the three supporting arms in an amphibious assault. Initial supporting fires for the landing force are usually provided by naval gunfire and by aircraft until artillery is phased ashore unit by unit. The artillery mission is the same as in land warfare, but employment differs because of the characteristics of an amphibious operation. This film will show artillery planning and employment in an amphibious assault, concentrating on the differences from normal land warfare. Marine units are shown, but the same principles would be applicable with Army artillery. First, a summary of the major differences from normal land warfare in employment of artillery. Artillery does not engage in preparation fires, except when adjacent promontories or islands are available, and surprise is not a major factor. Control of artillery is decentralized from the time of embarkation until adequate control facilities are established ashore. Some artillery units may be attached to battalion or regimental landing teams. Some may be attached to helicopter-borne units. Other units may be transported on many types of ships. Since the first units to land are direct support units, the ability to mass fires is initially limited in an amphibious assault. The landing of general support units and artillery command and control elements at the earliest practicable time is a major planning consideration. The artilleryman may face operating limitations, particularly in early stages of the amphibious assault. Initial position areas may be small and near the front lines. Shortages of transportation ashore often cause difficulties in occupation of positions, in supply and resupply, particularly of ammunition, and in establishment and maintenance of communications. Coordination of supporting arms is more complex in an amphibious assault. Coordination centers are initially afloat, with almost all coordination and target information controlled at the highest level. Three supporting arms are present instead of two. And finally, all this activity must be phased ashore into a landing force fire support coordination center whose personnel first serve in the supporting arms coordination center afloat, observing and advising. Another consideration in artillery planning is arranging embarkation so that artillery can be landed at the time and place where it is needed. We'll look backward to see how these difficulties are overcome and who's responsible for artillery planning for the amphibious operation. In the Marine Corps, division level artillery planning is the responsibility of the artillery regiment commander in his role as a division special staff officer. There is also concurrent planning, artillery representatives working with infantry personnel at lower levels down through the battalion landing team. Artillerymen conduct coordinated planning with naval gunfire and air representatives at all levels. They are concerned with coordination of artillery with naval gunfire and air support and also with availability of landing craft, landing ships and helicopters for landing artillery. Early in the planning phase, the artillery officer estimates his ability to support each of the landing force commander's proposed courses of action. The landing force mission is considered, the enemy situation, required artillery support, and hydrographic factors affecting landing of artillery units.
The effect of topography on artillery operations is always important, as is weather, observation requirements, and communications requirements. After consideration of all factors, an artillery estimate of supportability is prepared, presenting advantages and disadvantages of each proposed course of action from an artillery viewpoint. Informal estimates may be prepared at lower echelons. The formal recommendation is then presented to the landing force commander. The commanders select a primary course of action and alternates and planning proceeds at all levels. An estimate of artillery requirements is made after the landing force commander has announced his concept of operation. Artillery planners consider all factors of land warfare, plus the number and type of naval guns available, with duration of gunfire support from naval vessels, and availability of other fire support means. The estimate ensures that adequate artillery support will be provided to all maneuver elements and to the force as a whole. It lists the amount and type of artillery by caliber, amount and type of ammunition and fuses, requirements for special equipment, and the number and types of ships, landing craft, amphibian vehicles and helicopters required to transport and land the artillery. Finally, the artillery plan is prepared based on the landing force commander's concept of operation, final allocation of artillery units, and tactical principles for artillery employment. The plan gives the organization for combat, including assignment of artillery units to task-organized battalion and regimental landing teams, and assignment of tactical missions to units retained under control of the senior artillery commander. It also lists landing beaches and times of landing, in addition to the other elements covered by an artillery plan for land warfare. The plan is published as the Artillery Annex, or occasionally, as an appendix to the Fire Support Annex of the Operation Plan or Order. The organization for embarkation must preserve the tactical integrity of task units established by the organization for combat as far as possible. Crews embark with their weapons wherever practical. Artillery units attached to battalion or regimental landing teams embark with those units. Artillery retained under artillery command is organized in separate embarkation groupings. The organization for embarkation must assign artillery units to shipping which will facilitate their early landing. These preloaded landing craft will be carried by LSDs and LPDs. They'll be ready to enter action immediately. LSTs are used for artillery landing directly over a beach or causeway. Light artillery can be preloaded aboard amphibian vehicles if offshore reefs have to be crossed. APAs and AKAs may be used for artillery, but unloading time and hazards are increased. AKAs create another problem. Their limited troop accommodations generally do not afford space for crews, and pre-H-hour transfers must be planned. Command and control personnel are embarked in a manner that will facilitate accomplishment of their missions. Forward observer teams with the infantry companies they support. Artillery air observers on the ships carrying their aircraft. Liaison teams from direct support artillery batteries or battalions with the headquarters of the supported BLTs or RLTs. And the division artillery officer with selected fire support coordination personnel aboard the Amphibious Task Force flagship. A properly organized embarkation is the key to an efficient landing, and the organization for embarkation 
must grow out of the organization for combat. The waterborne ship-to-shore movement is underway. First to land are the LVTHs, howitzer-carrying amphibian vehicles. Artillery forward observer and liaison teams land with the infantry units they support. Reconnaissance parties from direct support artillery units land as early as the situation ashore permits. Meanwhile, offshore the firing units normally wait on call, boated if enough landing craft are available. Direct support artillery is normally ordered to land on recommendation of the artillery reconnaissance party, which usually is led by the artillery unit commander. Unless there is an emergency, he normally makes his recommendation only when he sees that planned position areas will soon be freed of small arms fire. The commander of the supported unit then requests authority to land the direct support artillery. Warehouse, Charger, request serials 510 through 514 be landed over Red Beach. The request usually goes through a shore party unit which relays it by radio to the tack log party aboard the primary control vessel. Understand charge request serials 510 through 514 be landed, Red Beach. Tack log refers the request to the flagship where the landing force commander must approve and the amphibious task force commander must concur and order the landing. The firing units land first followed by remaining elements. The artillery unit establishes communications as soon as it reaches its position area, then begins firing in direct support. In the helicopter-borne ship-to-shore movement, artillery forward observer teams, liaison teams, and reconnaissance parties land with the infantry as in the waterborne movement. These elements are usually reduced in size, however. On-call artillery units wait offshore aboard their helicopter transports. The troop commander sends his request for a landing to the helicopter support team at the landing zone. The HST, doing the same job as the shore party in a waterborne landing, relays the request over its logistical net to the battalion tack log, which is usually in the helicopter transport group flagship. Blade four forward, blade four rear. Roger. Understand request serial 315 through 326 as soon as possible. Landing zone Robin. We'll go out. The request is then processed exactly as in the waterborne movement, but the on-call artillery unit is landed directly at the position area, if possible. Helicopter-borne artillery may be landed in scheduled waves, especially if the landing zone is beyond range of effective naval gunfire support. The ship-to-shore movement of artillery continues. Next to land is the remaining direct support artillery, then the general support artillery, and the artillery regiment headquarters. With his headquarters and the general support artillery ashore, the artillery commander is ready to exercise control of his regiment. He can now reorganize at will to deliver effective fire where needed. From the artillery standpoint, the amphibious operation has assumed the characteristics of land warfare. As artillery supports the assault with all the massed power of which it is capable. <laughs>